Our church needs the protection from false teaching. Why? Open your Bibles, please, to Titus chapter 1, verse 10. Our church needs the protection from false teachers, for there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group, they must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. And this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. May God bless the reading of His holy word. False teaching was about to derail the Cretan church, spilling their toxic poison all over the landscape, burning with the fires of hell, floating clouds all above the island of Crete, polluting their spiritual health. And St. Paul, the apostle, deputizes, sends intentional interim pastor Titus to Crete to choose elders who, quote, will hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that they can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it, Titus 1.9. Why? Many rebellious people mere talkers, especially those of the circumcision group. Doesn't that sound judgmental? It does, doesn't it? It is because he's judging false judges. Rebellious people who will not put themselves under the authority of the elders of the local church. Mere talkers who only talk but don't walk. They're full of lots of ideas, but the life really isn't changed. They are deceivers. They are disingenuous. Maybe they're self-deceived, but the result is they deceive you as well. And then Paul calls them out by name, especially those of the circumcision group. He doesn't mince words. He names the group who are misleading this flock. It's the same group that almost split the church just years after Jesus ascended into heaven. Yes, the early church, we look in Acts chapter 2, and it's, it's a beautiful picture of what the church should be like, but shortly thereafter, there were controversies, there were false teachers, and in Acts chapter 15, we read that some brothers came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute with them. That's a scary time in a church, isn't it? Sharp dispute. And what was this dispute about? It was about what's required for salvation. For the circumcision group insisted that you're really not saved unless you are circumcised. Now, in Israel, there are two signs that you are a true Israelite, circumcision and obeying the Sabbath. And this group from Judea, from the Jerusalem church even, were saying, Really, Christianity is just one branch of Judaism. It's, it's, it's a sect. But really, if you really want to be saved, you need to be baptized, circumcised. Now, it sounds to me like, and in fact, I can see it in the world and churches today, that some people will try to convince you that unless you are baptized and join our church, you really aren't saved. That's true. 
Well, I grew up in a denomination that when I dated my dear wife, who's more godly than I ever will ever be, she was a Presbyterian. And I'm Baptist. And I really doubted she was really born again. <laughs> so it wasn't really, a, you know, taught out like that. But I know some churches that really teach that. If you're not part of this church, you're not going to heaven. And be careful with that. That's what was going on way back when, 20 years, the church was only 20 years old, and you had that division happening already about salvation, what really it's all about. And this false teaching almost destroyed the Galatian church. And Paul wrote that letter to that unhealthy church by writing, and here's what he said in Galatians 1, 6, and 7, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of grace, the gospel of Christ. So what is the gospel of Christ? What does the Bible say? What does Jesus say is necessary for salvation? Well, in John 5.24, it says, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and is, will not be condemned. They've been crossed over from death to life. That's without being baptized. That's the thief on the cross. And as you read the Gospel of John and you talk about and all the salvation messages, that is the only requirement for being born again. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. No other additions. Immediately, you become a child of God that we sang about. He's adopted you into his family, and there's that gospel seed planted inside of you that as it grows, it, yes, produces fruit, but that is not necessary for salvation. Otherwise, we've got all these fruit inspectors walking around thinking, I don't really think you're saved, Shirley, because I don't see you doing things like I do. If you're really spiritual like me, you'll shave your heads. <laughs> Old joke. <laughs> this sound doctrine of salvation by faith alone is the basic truth we must know, we must believe, and we must defend and proclaim. The uncircumcised, Gentile, ignorant jailer, not he wasn't ignorant because he was a jailer, but he had no clue of all the history of Israel, except maybe the hymns he heard Paul and Silas sing. And when they were broke free, he fell on his knees and he said in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas said to him, believe Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved, you and your household. And when that happened, then they were baptized. You see, Christian truth about salvation and sanctification, salvation by faith alone, but as you grow, yes, there's obedience. Yes, there's fruit. People get that confused sometimes, thinking unless you show fruit, you're really not saved. This false teaching of adding other requirements to be saved still corrupts the gospel of free grace. The Reformation of 1517, Martin Luther began because he was a Catholic monk, and a guy named Tetzel came riding through town one day, raising, it was a fundraising uh, trip to build the Sistine Chapel. And so Tetzel had a little ditty. He says, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And Luther said, that doesn't square with the just shall live by faith. And thus began, he wrote his 95 thesis, says, listen, folks, salvation, the Bible alone, these 66 books, the Bible alone is where we should get our doctrine and we'll find that it's faith alone in Christ alone, the cry of the Reformation, and it's still true. Faith alone that doesn't add religion, doesn't add works, doesn't add any kind of spiritual gifts or any other kind of experience is that you are now a baby in Christ, and hopefully you'll grow to be a mature adult 
And sound doctrine is the pure milk of the Word, which helps us grow thereby. Verses 11 and 12 of Titus 1, Paul says to this group and these people, they must be silenced because they're ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach. And that for the sake of dishonest gain. He talks about their motives. Even one of their own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. That's kind of racist or stereotypical. I don't think that's politically correct to say that anymore, but Paul was quoting one of their own poets, Epimenides, 500 B.C. The Cretans were notorious for their lies and their lifestyle, which was so unbiblical and unchristlike. And Paul says, listen, you are living in that environment, and you need to focus on what the truth says. Don't follow notorious Cretans. In fact, the word for lying, well, the new word was, was, was coined in the new dictionary for new words for, for 35 AD was Cretan, which means to be a liar. That's where it, where it came from, the word, the Cretos. Don't follow the lying Cretans, but follow the noble Bereans. In Acts 17, 11, it says, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Open up your Bibles. All Scripture must agree with all Scripture. The Bible is like a beautiful puzzle fitly put together, and every piece of the puzzle, you can't jam it into a place that doesn't belong. You can't leave out pieces of the puzzle and have a complete picture. All Scripture interprets Scripture and doesn't contradict Scripture. And the Bereans knew that. What Paul is saying here in verses 12 and 11 and 12 is follow the money trail. Hold these guys accountable to see where the money's going. This is my pay for today? <laughs> no. Some guys think it is. Some pastors even own their buildings. That sounds kind of dishonest to me. You're not in it for the money. Or you're in the wrong profession. Anyway, follow the money trail. Hold them financially accountable for how they spend their money. Thank God that we try to be transparent glass pockets here so you can see exactly where the money goes, where it's spent. But we're places where you don't know that. Be careful. Follow teachers who are the real deal. Men of integrity, honesty, transparency, and what I call congruity. Their walk matches their talk all the time and follow Scripture. Verse 13, Paul says, this testimony is true. They're liars. What I'm saying is true. Wow. Make a decision. And then Paul says, therefore, because of this, rebuke them sharply. Not just hint at it, not just, you know, but the word sharply is like, to, it means to cut abruptly. Not crudely with a butter knife, but with the precision of a surgeon with a scalpel that's very sharp to excise the cancer that's there. Godly elders are to take the initiative and confront false teaching before it spreads like cancer throughout the whole body. That's not easy to do. It's not a fun thing to do, but it must be done. That's what Paul did with the Galatian church. He stood up to the apostle Peter in a face-to-face -face public showdown about doctrine. He rebuked him sharply for and so Philippian, um, excuse me, Galatians 2:11 to 14. Paul writes to the Galatian church, he's still, my goodness, you open the book to Galatians, you need to wear a best of suit because it's flaming in there. That's it's a hot book. Paul says, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him face to his face because he was in the wrong. Peter? Who wrote? First and second Peter? He's wrong about what? And Paul goes on, before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. See, we're talking about what food is sure, what makes you clean or unclean. And the Jewish uh, tradition said you must, you know, wash your hands, eat kosher food. And Peter, you know, in, when he went to Cornelius' house, he went into the house. He ate their 
unkosher food. But now, when these certain men from James came, when they arrived, he drew back to separate himself from the Gentile because he's afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group. Fear does a lot of things, doesn't it? You just want to be a chameleon to fit into the crowd, and that's what Peter did. And you know his life history. When people want to cancel you, you're one of us, you're not one of them. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, that was Paul's close friend and mentor, the one who helped Paul along in his ministry, even Barnabas was led astray. And when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth, I said to Peter, the pillar of the church, in front of them all, you are a Jew Yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How was it then that you forced Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? What's the big deal in the book of Galatians? It is the freedom that we have in Christ to be all that Christ has called us to be. It is against what is called legalism and little rules and preferences and traditions of men that say if you're really saved, you're going to be like us, walk like us, dress like us, cut your hair like me, and think like me. Oh, well, you're out of here. That's not freedom. That's abusive. But especially in the area of salvation, unless you're circumcised, you really don't belong here to eat at the table with me. I don't read that in the Bible. Come to the table, all who place your faith in Jesus as Savior. So why should elders face off with false teachers and rebuke their teaching to protect the church. Yes, but also look at verse 13. There's another reason, so that they may be sound in the faith and pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. Paul wants to see these guys redeemed, reconciled, on the right track, rebuke and correct and teach in righteousness. The purpose of teaching sound doctrine is not to annihilate the false teachers, but to give them health to be godly people. Now, the word sound in verse 14 is repeated three other times in the book of Titus, four times in all, of course. We read in verse uh, chapter uh, uh, 1, verse 9, here in verse 14, and in chapter 2, verse 1 in chapter 2, it says unto to the, to Pastor Titus, now I want you to teach the older men what's in accord with sound doctrine and teach a younger man, and so forth, and the women, sound doctrine. So that's a big emphasis in the book. And so I want to try to help you understand why sound doctrine makes a difference in the quality of your lives. We'll talk more about that next week. Sound, the word means actually healthy, robust, vital, strong, energetic, alert. Life is good. Not, I don't know. That. No. Sound doctrine produces sound, healthy lives. In fact, Jesus uses this word in Luke 5, 31. It's not the sound that need a doctor, but the sick. The word sound is the word healthy. When we talk about the Lord sending gifted people to lead your church, pastor teachers, one of the purposes is that he might equip you with the truth. Why? In Ephesians 4.14 it says, Then we'll no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, you all, speaking the truth to one another in love, will grow in all things, grow up to him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now, that's a picture of a healthy church. How many of you have joints that don't work anymore, ligaments that fall apart? Healthy church, they got strong legs, strong arms. They do this spiritually because they're dealing in truth. Trust is built on the biblical truth. 
the truth is necessary for the false teacher's healing. Just say the truth. Paul's purpose, of course, was to convince those false teachers to be sound in the truth, in the faith. And yes, he's protecting us as well. You see, false doctrine is like a yeast, just a little bit. Those you bake are talking about, you put it in the, and it enters secretly, it grows quickly, and it permeates the whole uh, bread loaf until all of a sudden it's ready. And the best time to, atta uh, to attack false doctrine is at the very beginning and cut it out before it has a chance to spread. Now, we grow up in a society now where people say, I'm Mike, Mike, doctrine divides. Let's just all get along. Have you heard that? Maybe it does, and maybe it should, but only in love. But what I hear Jesus say in John 8, 32, the truth shall make you free. Now, let's don't take that out of context. As so many people do and say, my, my, it's my truth that makes you free. No, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, then you really are my disciples and the truth will make you free. That's the truth of what the Bible says. If you want real freedom, know what the Bible says. Again, we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. But right now, our focus is, look at here, pay no attention to the Jewish myths and to the commands of those who reject the truth. Pay no attention to that sick stuff. Now, my aunt, when she was in nursing school years ago, and two, several aunts were nurses, and they would get out their medical books and start reading and finding out about all these illnesses. Margaret Ann knew that she had that illness. She read next week about another one, and she knew she had that illness. Have, have, do you know people like that? Oh, my goodness, I've got this... Don't even go there, folks. <laughs> Pay no attention to it. You don't have the real disease. False teaching is like a spiritual carcinogen that affects your thinking so that you are deceived. And I see folks that are good, kind people, and that kindness is part of their religion, and they try to be kind. Why don't they believe the Bible? Why are these people so focused on the kind of things they do in their denominations? It's, I think it's deception, self-deception from false teaching. So when someone leaves a tract at your door, don't even take it in your house. Don't even negotiate. Pay no attention to it. Toss it. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even study it. Jewish myths. Uh, that can refer to a lot of things from Gnosticism, which is Greek philosophy about based on Plato and that, that the body is, is bad and the spirit is good. And so we have all these angels that bring us, you know, it's new age stuff is what it is nowadays. Jewish myths, maybe Kabbalism and that kind of thing. But Paul wrote to another pastor, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer or devote themselves to myths and en endless genealogies of angels, 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 angels. How many angels on a pinhead? Whatever. They promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. Folks, let's focus on the main thing. Those in other churches know I keep saying, keep the main thing the main thing. Because that's the main thing. <laughs> love God, love people, give life, make disciples. Pay no attention to the commands of those who reject the truth. So do you believe what Jesus says about the Bible? No. Then reject it because they're giving you commands that aren't biblical. That happened to Jesus. It blinded the yeast of deception, blinded the Pharisees and teachers of the law when they asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? There's the kosher thing again. The, be the biggest offense that they could drum up about Jesus is their disciples have dirty hands when they eat. Shame on them and change that. And how often our traditions and our nostalgia, we remember the good things about them and forget the bad stuff. I do. But here's what Jesus said about their focus on unclean elder traditions. He said, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. My friends, 
let us focus on the commands of God. Let's do that, whatever it takes. Verse 15 kind of sums it up. And this verse is often taken out of context. Verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their hands and their consciences are corrupted. Now, the word pure is the word for cleanliness. Catharsis, you know, the word catharsis, that's where we get this word. The word comes from that. And the application that Paul is making here was about kosher. What's clean and what's unclean, what's pure and what's, and what's pure. And Jesus fought this battle, as I said, in, in Matthew 15, verses 16 to 19, he says, are you so dull? Sometimes he says that to me, and I say, yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> How did I miss this? And he goes on to say, don't you know that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come from out of the mouth into the heart, and these make a man unclean. The things that come out of the mouth from the heart make these a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts and murder, adultery, se- sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unkosher, unclean, but eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. As I tried to think about what's the main idea I want you to walk away with today as this passage is, Is your heart clean? Is your heart pure? We're not talking about the circumstances. We're not talking about kosher food. We're not talking about any kind of legal kind of stuff. Look into my heart, Lord, because if I'm clean inside, all things are clean. And what a joy that is. Be free of that. If the heart is pure, then food is pure. You can eat lobster, and you can eat bacon. Hallelujah. Uh, But it's not an issue of outward conformity. Corruption inside of my heart is what the problem is here. Now, I've heard the story about a fraternity prank that some guys did to one of his brothers. This young man was known to fall asleep anywhere, and in the living room of the fraternity house, he was sound asleep, snoring, and so his, his fraternity brothers played a harmless, not a hazing, but a harmless trick on him. They took the foulest smelling cheese they could find. I think at Limburger may qualify. It was kind of pasty, and so he was snoring, and they kind of pasted it right there. And they, and they stood back in the living room and watched him. And he got up, and he says, man, something smells in this room. This, this room stinks. And he walks over and he smells the guys. You guys stink. And he walks around the front room. This whole place stinks. And he walks out on the porch of the front door and says, the whole world stinks. Because your heart stinks. Your heart is corrupt. Out of the heart comes these things. Don't blame everybody else or the food. It's in your heart that must be dealt with. It's the heart. And until we are born again, and he gives us a new heart, nothing's going to be clean. Corruption is the culprit. And the new covenant that Jesus ratified with his blood, I will give you a new heart. So that you want to be with me, that you want to love me, that you will come into my presence and and fellowship with me. It's not a duty, it's a delight. If you listen to your new heart, of course, as we've taught in the past, and you read in Romans chapter 6, there's another part of us called the sin nature, which kind of tells us, no, no, I'd rather do those things that make me feel miserable and be a slave to it and be addicted. No, I, it's, I don't have time to do I'll talk about that next week. But right now, what I want to say is corruption. Both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. Corruption, that stain, 
out, out damn spot that won't come off my hands, that, that tinge, that dye of another color, those, those glasses that we wear, which gives us the perspective that deceives us. We think all the world is that color or smells that way, and it really doesn't. You need a clean mind and a pure conscience to be clean. And praise God, that's what he does. Now, I love the story of Pinocchio. In fact, I've preached on it. There's so many spiritual illustrations. I won't get into them all right now. But Jiminy Cricket would say to Pinocchio, let your conscience be your guide. Nope. Because the Bible tells us that many people's consciences are seared and they're corrupted and they're filthy. And if you're going to follow your heart, which heart are you following? This is the whole issue of false teaching. Is it sounds good. It feels good. I'm free to do this. But what does the Bible say? Conscience, literally knowing with, co-knowledge of oneself, awareness. I love what uh, Andrew Murray writes about conscience and about the blood cleanses us from all corruption in our conscience. The power of the blood washes us clean. And until then, we read about our conscience can be seared with a hot iron and takes the joy out of life. First Timothy 4, 1 to 5. Again, Paul writes to Pastor Timothy, the Spirit clearly says that in later days, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. You burned yourself, you know, you stick your hand in the oven and touch the rack and it burns and you can't feel anything. That's what your conscience is unless it's cleansed by the blood of Christ. And here's, what, here's the result. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving to those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it's concentrated by the Word of God and prayer. This changes your diet, don't you think? Changes your marriage. It's not a... This, these kind of teachers take the joy out of the abundant life. Verse 16, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. You know, actions speak louder than words. And Paul just nails it. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So look under the sheepskin and you'll see the wolves. Look under the hood and you'll see the motor's not there. <laughs> or the transmission doesn't work. The powertrain, they looks great on the outside. It's nice and shiny, but you go one mile and the thing breaks down. And that's what these hypocrites are. They have an outside exterior that makes them look holy and they act holy, but inside... Dead man's bones, Jesus put it up, the Pharisees. They're corrupt because their true natures are liars, 1 John 2, 4. Impure consciences make them unclean and render them detestable in these things. And so it's important that your conscience and your mind is washed clean with the Word of God by the blood of Christ. So what? Let's just apply this, try to work this because I'm, next week it'll be all about application. So I try to teach you to live by sound doctrine. So what? Let us hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that we can encourage others. It's an encouragement of a sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. I want to encourage you. I want you to know God's Word. I want it to permeate your lives so that it, you know have His wisdom. When He speaks, you'll recognize it. Francis Schaeffer, great uh, theologian, philosopher, wrote a book, No Little People, and he said, As I see it, the Christian life must uh, comprise of three concentric circles, each with its, uh, must be kept in its proper place. In the outer circle must be the correct theological position, true biblical orthodoxy, and the purity of the visible church. That's why we're talking about rebuke sharply when that invades that. This is first, 
But if that is all there is, Schaefer goes on, it's just one more seedbed for spiritual pride. And I can show you all my theological books, but does it change us? This makes us proud, knowledge puffs up. The second circle must be good intellectual training and comprehension of our own generation. In other words, each one of you, whatever age or stage you're in, to comprehend what the Word of God says for the circumstances that you're in. But having only this leads to intellectualism and again provides a seabed for pride. That's the second circle. But in the, the bullseye, the middle circle, Schaefer White's must be a humble heart. The love of God, the devotional attitude towards God, there must be the daily practice of the reality of the God whom we know is there. These three circles must be properly established, emphasized, and related to each other. The humble heart. Have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. And he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. He is our example of humility. Humility is that quality that makes us teachable, that, that removes the pride that some right in your wrong kind of attitude. But let's learn together. It's the heart. And Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure, the same word for uh, clean, clean. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The windshield of their conscience has been cleansed off, and they will see God. Do you want to see God in your life, experience Him? Pure in heart. And that comes by doctrine of truth coming together. And we'll say we'll talk more about it next week, but just suffice it as, as what sound doctrine, how it makes us healthy. Let me just say this. Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near to God. Oh, let us draw near to God. Don't stand outside the door of the kingdom. Go into his palace and fellowship with him. Invites you. He welcomes you. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let us draw near to the God with that sincere heart, with, with full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and have our bodies washed with pure water. Oh, to have your conscience where you can come into his presence. With no shame, the guilt has been covered by his blood. God is satisfied with what Jesus did for you on the cross. And the, and the, and the curtain that separated everybody from the Holy of Holies was torn apart from top to bottom when he was crucified. Access to the very throne of grace that you might find help in time of need. Oh, let us draw near to God. And with sound doctrine, seeking God's wisdom, You'll be transformed through the renewing of your minds. Our church needs sound doctrine, and next week I'm going to do my very best to try to help you, give you some tools to help you draw nearer to Him, dealing with your mind and your conscience and those things that beset us, those sins that so easily entangle us, that you might fix your eyes on Jesus. So I'd like you to write a letter to your new pastor. And uh, so you'll see that after studying Titus 1, 10 to 16, dear pastor, I want you to know that I value sound doctrine. I want to have a clean conscience, something along those lines. So when he shows up here and he looks out there, he sees people that are teachable, that love God with all their hearts, that Stay true to the commands of God that are ready for revival in this place, in your hearts. Oh, it'll be so good that a new pastor is here permanently. Then you know where you're going. <laughs> but don't stop now. Don't lose heart. The search team is working hard for every person we look at. They listen to how many messages, 
hour upon hour, right? It's a lot of work that these your volunteer people are doing. And we've come a long ways, and we're close to the finish line. Don't lose heart. But let this time of testing cleanse your heart. And write your pastor, oh, I'm ready. <laughs> I am so ready to see you do a great work that we can leave a legacy for those that come behind us. May he find you faithful. Almighty God in heaven, have your way with us. With this, your church, send to us our new pastor and send along with him more people to join us in the work, Lord. You know our bodies are wearing out. And we just need that grace in our lives that you love us. And we want to draw near to you. Right here, right now, in Jesus' name.